Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining today's Indeed Jobcast on salary negotiation and reaching your earning potential. My name is LaFawn Davis, and I am Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at Indeed. Before we get started, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping notes. So the first one is um, you are in listen-only mode. You can hear us, but we can't hear you. We're recording, and you can view this webinar later on demand on YouTube. And then lastly, please ask questions, and don't be shy. Post your questions on the Indeed community discussion using the link, and our team of career coaches will be answering. I wanted to take a moment to really acknowledge that the current situation that we're in is not business as usual. I know you hear things like, we're in the new normal, and we don't know what's going on. It can be a difficult time to talk about money, but we are here to help. And if you want information specifically about navigating the job search during the era of COVID-19, watch our webinar on that topic, which you can find along with the other resources at indeed.com slash here to help. It's important that you know that you're not alone and that we're here for you. And that's why we're doing these job casts. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Claire Wasserman, today's presenter. She really needs no introduction, but she was named one of Entrepreneur Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women. Claire is the founder of Ladies Get Paid, a platform that champions the professional and financial advancement of women. Their community of 70,000 women worldwide support one another through sharing advice, resources, job opportunities, and more. Claire is also currently writing a book about women, work, and self-worth to be published by Simon & Schuster in 2021. And with that, take it away, Claire. Thank you so much, LaFun. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry that we're not all in person. That would be first best, but this is second best, and I'm so glad that you could all be here tonight with us. Uh, so let's get started. There's a ton of things to cover, um, but we're going to cover it all. Uh, and if you have questions, go into the community, start asking them, um, and we can continue this conversation afterwards. But before I officially begin, I got to warn you, I'm going to say some things that are kind of depressing. Um, but the reason I'm going to tell you these things is because I want to show you why it is so incredibly important to negotiate. Okay. All right. So 60% of today's college graduates are women, right? We're the majority of the people graduating and okay, that's the good news, right? Bad news. 22% of us are making it past middle management. Next one, right? Wage gap. Anybody heard of the wage gap? We tend to talk about it being eh, 78 cents to the dollar. That's what women make. Well, hold on now. When you take that wage gap and you break it down by different factors, where you live, if you're married or not, uh, by race, ethnicity, okay? So black women are making between 63 and 68 cents on the dollar. This is really bad. Hispanic women are making 55 cents on the dollar. Okay. So it was actually these statistics that got me to do something, right? I said, I've got to do something, but what are you going to do? When you hear something this systemic and overwhelming and, and depressing, as an individual, you know, what is the next step that I could possibly take to combat something like this? And so I had this realization. I mean, it took me about a year to get there, but my realization was, you know what? If I could go and make more money, if I could learn to negotiate my own salary, well, then at least, you know, I'd be closing the wage gap in my own life. And then I had an aha moment, which is if I could teach another woman how to negotiate her salary, and then maybe she could teach another woman how to negotiate her salary. Okay, so then collectively, if we were all closing our own gaps, okay, maybe, just maybe, we were moving the needle. Now, of course, we need companies to pay us properly. We need the government to help with policies that help pay us properly. Not saying it should all be on us at all, but I want you to walk out of this webinar right now and to think to yourself, there is actually something I can do. No matter how small the step is, it's still a step moving forward. So, so keep that in mind throughout the whole conversation tonight. So just a quick overview of what we'll be covering. Uh, the first is shifting your mindset. Um, salary negotiation comes with a lot of emotional baggage. If I could see you right now, I bet you're probably nodding along with me, right? There's fear, uh, anxiety, 
Um, it's something new, right? There's the unknown. You're not sure if they're going to say yes to you. Okay. So we've got to shift the mindset from one of feeling afraid to hopefully a mindset where you actually see this as an opportunity. So that's going to be my challenge tonight. Can I get you to be even excited about salary negotiation? All right. Calculating your market value. Everything comes down to evidence. You don't just walk in there and say, I want this raise because I deserve it. Even if you do deserve it, and I know that you deserve it, right? It has to be rooted in a number that you have found in the research that you've done, right? It's just facts, right? But then the question is, well, where do you look? Now, of course you look at Indeed, but there are other places that you can look for that number. And of course that comes with it. How do you even talk about money? right? Because I'm going to ask you to have conversations with people in your life and that can be uncomfortable. So part of our conversation tonight is how do you broach the subject in a way where everybody can feel like it's okay to talk about money. Then after that, you've done the research, you're feeling pretty good, but you're not done. I want you to have a range that you come into that negotiation with. Meaning if you only have one number, well, the negotiation is going to get kind of awkward pretty quickly because guess what? You've got one number, they've got another number, what do you do? What you do is you have numbers in your back pocket. So what we're going to talk about is how do you take the market research and then distill it down into a series of numbers that essentially acts as this kind of framework for you. But you can get more than just money. It's called full compensation. I'm super excited to talk to you about this because especially in a time when maybe you're not getting raises, right? We're all dealing with COVID and, and the uncertainty that comes with um, our jobs and our job security, right? So chances are maybe you might get a no for this year. Doesn't matter. You're still going to try to negotiate, but let's say you get a no. The good news is, is you could absolutely ask for things beyond the paycheck. And so we'll talk about what those are. And then we'll also talk about how do you position the ask as a benefit to them even though it's for you. Uh, all right, all of this is great. Doesn't actually matter if you can't tell a story about why you are excellent, right? So you're gonna come in there with that top dollar. You're gonna say, I did my market research and I want top dollar, but they're only gonna give it to you if they believe that you are a top performer. It is on you to make that case. This can actually be really uncomfortable for, for a lot of us and particularly for women if you, um, you feel like you're bragging by talking about how great you are. So we've got to get over that mindset, but there's also a way to tell your story. And so I'm going to walk you through um, a method that I have for that. The last part about all this, and this is the part that you've um, really come here for, is what are all the scenarios you might find yourself in when you negotiate? And what do you say? Um, and the scripts that I'm going to give you, it's not just here's one way to say it. It's here are a couple of options because honestly, I'm just giving you a framework tonight, right? What I'm telling you, yes, it's universal, but you've got to make it work for you. Whatever your situation is, whatever relationship that you have with your manager or, or for this new job that you're applying to, filter everything that I say and make it make sense for you. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, and of course, the last part here is the obvious one, which is uh, get paid. Yes, that is what we are doing. Enough of the preamble. Let us actually begin. All right. So just think for a minute. Close your eyes. When you imagine negotiating, you're in that room, you just closed the deal in terms of, all right, you got the offer, but now you got to talk about the money. How does it make you feel? What's that first feeling that comes to mind? Right? Is it, I don't know, nausea, vomit? <laughs> you know, do you feel your heart starting to race? Okay, let me tell you right now, you are not the only one. Uh, and also, by the way, the people negotiating with you on the other side might be feeling nervous too. Uh, so keep that in mind. You are not alone and there's no shame in having that feeling. Uh, all right, so let me walk through um, a couple of mindsets here that I've heard from my community and, and maybe you've um, felt them uh, as well. Okay, so this fear that they won't like you, right? That by pushing back, by saying you want more, that you're somehow, I don't know, disrupting the relationship or jeopardizing the relationship. Um, I think that often comes uh, for women because we're socialized to be nice, right? To accommodate other people, uh, to be a good girl. Um, here's what I think. I think it never has anything to do with what you're saying, but really it's how are you saying it? If you have done your research, which you will do, and you're presenting a really clear, compelling case with lots of empathy, you're appreciating the opportunity, you're excited to work there, what you look like is a really professional person, right? Um, so you're making a case, but it's not just give me the money. You know, it's done in a way that makes the other person want to listen to you, want to say yes. Um, so that's how I would I would approach it. Um, and also, by the way, they're expecting you to negotiate. The first offer they give you, chances are 
that's not actually their last offer, right? They're presenting an offer knowing that you will and you should be negotiating, right? And so by you pushing back, because it's accepted, because this is a thing that everybody should be doing, why would you be penalized for it? So again, it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. Okay, so how about this mindset of, you know, I just feel so lucky to have the opportunity. Lucky is an interesting word. Keep in mind, you got yourself there, right? If you're in the part of the interview process where you're even talking about money, right? Or you've been given the job or you've been working there for a while to be talking now about getting a raise, they want you there, right? They feel lucky. Remember that, guys. Both people who are trying to figure something out are equally invested in making this work. So maybe instead of feeling so lucky, you could have gratitude, right? I'm, you know, I have gratitude that I'm here. But give yourself some credit. Uh, I think I need to underprice myself to be competitive. Is that something you've ever felt? I think um, for a number of freelancers, uh, sometimes it's sort of this race to the bottom. Whoever sort of charges the least gets the gig. Be very careful with that because whatever you price yourself at, it's you saying, this is the value that I think I have. I've interviewed people who have quoted themselves so low, I thought, I honestly thought, what's wrong with them? They, they must not be as good, right? It's all perception, right? You pay more money for luxury goods because there's an assumption that there's more value there. Uh, so let me give you just a quick analogy. Um, imagine that you are going to the liquor store. You're invited to a dinner party uh, and you want to bring wine. Ah, oh, dinner parties. All right, I guess we could do a dinner party through Zoom, but you know, man, it feels like another era. Uh, so you go to the liquor store, you go to the wine section and you're on a budget. So you get the cheapest bottle of wine and you're bringing it to the register. And you're looking at that bottle of wine and you're thinking, this probably tastes disgusting. Like this probably is not very good. So you go back. But again, you're on a budget. So you then look at the wines and go, okay, I'm going to pick the second cheapest bottle of wine. Listen, that second cheapest bottle of wine might taste worse than the first one, but here is basically this kind of cost benefit analysis that you were doing, you're stereotyping, that price is important, but let's be careful if it's too low. Last thing I'm gonna say about why you shouldn't be underpricing yourself is that if every single one of us underprices ourselves, we've now just decreased rates for everybody. And we're making it easier for our employers to say, I'm going to find somebody cheaper next because there always is somebody cheaper. So let's make this collective decision right here, right now, that we are going to price ourselves at what is fair. Okay? What is fair? Not below. What is fair? Uh, and the last point here is I'm afraid I might lose the opportunity, right? And this stops a lot of people from negotiating. Um, I completely understand that. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you guys. The strongest negotiators are the people who are able and willing to walk away right? It's like, what do you have to lose? Well, you have your job to lose. So the best thing I can recommend for you is please, please make sure your finances are in order, especially during this time. You've got savings, right? You've got financial cushion, uh, anything you can do to make yourself feel strong and stand by the negotiation, right? Interview elsewhere. Have your eyes on what else is going on. Have a side hustle, right? So if you've got some kind of alternative that you're willing to walk away for, well, then you can stand there and be a strong negotiator, right? But if the offer is rescinded, which it really rarely does, I hear these horror stories every now and then, but very unlikely that they're now going to take away the offer. Um, chances are you guys are just going to figure out uh, a fee that works for everybody. So don't be afraid to do it. Um, but again, always have that financial cushion. Okay, so if you were here with me in person, I would have you write this down uh, and show it to me, but you know what? We're not in person. You're still going to write it down uh, for yourself. Why do you want to make more money, guys? Okay, you want to make more money for a lot of reasons. I get it. Um, but write down what are tangible things that you will spend your money on. And guys, it doesn't have to just be student debt. It can be shoes, right? It could be just things that you want in your life, not just what you need. The reason I'm having you do this is I want you now, when you go in to negotiate, you're negotiating for those things. Oftentimes we get really scared when it's this abstract thing. We're talking about numbers, right? We're not actually talking about numbers. We're talking about items that you will spend this on and things that are important to you. And if these things are important enough to you, then go and be a strong negotiator, right? You're negotiating for that house you want to buy. You're negotiating for your kid's college tuition, right? Making it concrete can help you stand even stronger. 
All right, let's talk about calculating the market value. Um, and this is where I'm so excited that we've partnered with Indeed tonight uh, because they are the perfect people to do this with. Okay, so the first thing here is as you're starting to look for your salary, um, you really have to contextualize it. So this isn't, you know, uh, I'm looking for a project manager role. No, it's I'm looking for a project manager in New York um, with five level, five years of experience uh, at a company that has 100 people, right? So here's a couple of things right here on the presentation that you see. Um, it takes into account what are all the factors that the employer is going to be thinking about as they decide who is going to be compensated the most. Obviously, if you have more skills, right, you've maybe gotten a certification, right? All those things should help you make a stronger case. Now, you're not just looking for one number, you're actually looking for what's called a pay band. Right. So a pay band is a range. And this is how employers are calculating how much to pay people. OK, so they've decided all of these different pay bands within the organization. And then depending on what you have to bring to the table and also how you're able to negotiate, you're going to fall somewhere in that pay band. So find a couple of numbers, right? There's never one perfect number, though we'll get to the three numbers that you'll end up picking. But for now, look at everything and anything. You just have to make sure that it's contextualized. So there is a salary calculator um, at Indeed. I told you, good partner for this uh, webinar tonight. It's free, it's anonymous, it has so much information. Um, the more evidence you can find to back yourself up, the better, okay? Because you're gonna feel better, first of all. You're gonna feel secure that you're asking for the correct amount because you've done all of this research. So this is a great place to start. Uh, but don't end, don't end with Indeed, don't end with online. Let's talk to real people, and that is my challenge to you. Can you find six different people and ask them how much either they make or how much they think you should be making? I know that's hard. So I would first start with recruiters. Go on LinkedIn. Look for recruiters, both um, it could be in-house at a company that you're interested in working for, although probably don't ask them how much you should make, and that would be more of a conversation about hiring you. Uh, so look at you know, recruiters who work for staffing agencies um, or who maybe work at a company you're not going to apply for, and tell them who you are. Give them some context about yourself and ask them if they'd be willing to give you feedback on how much you should charge. Okay, so what do you have to lose by doing that? Literally nothing the worst thing that can happen is that they just don't respond to you. The reason that they might actually respond to you is it's their job to find as much talent as possible to place for jobs. That's what they do for a living. So it's good for them to be aware of who's out there, who's ambitious, right? Who's looking for what? And so identify yourselves to those recruiters. Uh, the next thing to think about is networks in your life. All right. Who the um, first thing, um, groups. Are you in any groups? If you're not in Ladies Get Paid, come on over, ladiesgetpaid.com. And it's free. And once you join, we have a private online network where more than 70,000 people are sharing their salaries. Though they're mostly women, and so I have to remind them, please ask men because they are the ones making the most. And so that is something to keep in mind. You definitely don't want to ask other underpaid people uh, how much you know they're making um, and how much you should be making. But Ladies Get Paid is a good one. There are so many other professional networking groups, LinkedIn groups. If you went to college, go back to them. Go back to the alumni um, department. Go back to career resources and tell them that you're trying to figure out how much to charge. And not only that, that you have friends who are also trying to figure this out. So maybe right now the the alumni group, you know, or, or an organization doesn't happen to do this right now, you suggesting that they figure out a way for everybody to communicate their salaries, I think that's a great idea. They may just do it. The other thing to think about, and this is where everything important in my life has come from, and that is friends of friends of friends. So not just friends, we've got you know two more friends after that. Um, and let me tell you how I've done this in my life and how uh, you're going to do it tomorrow. And I guarantee you it is going to have a big impact on both your personal, professional life and how much you make. Uh, so the way that I activated my friends of friends of friends was I first thought about who in my world um, had a lot of uh, people that they knew. So I call this kind of person um, a portal, right? They're a portal person. And so essentially who this person is, is they're just incredibly well-known. Networked. You know, they're the person who seems to be, you know, the one in common with a bunch of other friends. And I reached out to these people first. And by the way, um, I'm, I'm one of those as well. And I said to them, I'm looking for work. This was many years ago. Um, I'm curious uh, if you guys know anybody who's hiring. 
And from there, we then created this whole email chain. It ultimately became so big uh, that we did BCC because at some point you don't you know, want to bother people. And it was this weekly BCC email where everybody who was looking for work and people who were hiring would put a little blurb in the email. Um, but they wouldn't just say, I'm looking for work. And you're not going to just say, I'm looking to figure out my salary. You're going to give your context because people don't have time. Right. And so the best way to get them to help you the quickest is just a couple of bullet points of the context that we just talked about. Right. Who you are, where you've applied, do your own research, come to them already. Here's the ballpark I found of the salaries. Does anybody know somebody or are any of you somebody who could tell me if I'm off base? Right. So start this with your friends, start it with talking about money, and then you can extend it to lots of other things when you guys are looking for stuff. So don't be afraid, friends of friends of friends. And you know, I know it's uncomfortable to talk about money, but we, um, I can tell you this right now, let's say if you didn't talk about money, that you wouldn't find out that you were being underpaid, and then you wouldn't get that rectified. What happens if you talked about money and you then got paid, I don't know, $10,000 extra because you discovered you should be asking for more? But then let's say you were too nervous to even begin to talk about this stuff. That meant that your silence was worth $10,000. Really, think about it right now. What do you have to lose by speaking up? And if you're wondering, well, it's uncomfortable, I don't want to make my friends feel bad because maybe I make more than them. Every single person at some point is trying to figure out how much to charge. Every single person at some point has to negotiate their salary. For you to be the first one to speak up, honestly, guys, you are doing them a favor, right? It's normalizing a conversation that every single person feels uncomfortable. And you can just call that out, right? When you bring it up, you can say, I know this is awkward. You can blame it on me. Say, ladies get paid told me to do this, right? Indeed told me to do this. Say you were reading an article about the wage gap, right? You can root it in something that's bigger than you. And I can tell you right now, as uncomfortable as it might be in the beginning, years later now, I mean, it's sort of all we talk about and um, it feels wonderful to embrace it. We're all dealing with it, so why not deal with it together? Now we've got to ready our range. So we did all this market research, right? Um, I've challenged you to find six people, real people, in addition to looking at Indeed and other sites. Um, by the way, another reason to come in with a lot of evidence is you can tell the employer where you did your research, right? So it's not just, I pick this number, okay? It's, I picked this number after talking to two recruiters, uh, the Career Resource Center at my college. Um, I looked at Indeed, you know, and then now it becomes a conversation, right? I believe you're, you're, you have real proof because you just backed it up. So try to get as many um, sources as possible, if not just to tell them that you did your research and to show that you know what you're talking about. But in that research, we've got to pick three numbers here, guys. Uh, so the first number is what I call rock star money. So this is the top of the range. Remember, we talked about that pay band. Uh, it's the top of the pay band. Uh, maybe you go a little bit higher, right? If this number doesn't make you uncomfortable, it's not high enough. Again, it still has to be rooted in your context in the market, so I'm not saying you go crazy here, right? But I want you to say a number that's uncomfortable. And I want you to say it so many times in front of the mirror, so many times in front of people you know, it becomes real. Think back to a salary you've gotten, I don't know, maybe three years ago, four years ago, maybe your first job, how about that? I think back to my first job and I remember that sum of money seemed so much, so much. And now when I look back, it's such a cute number. I'm so proud of myself that I got it, but it's actually a very small number. I also worked for a nonprofit, right? So think back to that first job and how big that number felt to you then and how you now feel about it. You grow, right? You grow. And so just think ahead in the next couple of years, how will you look back at the salary that you're asking for? Right. So it should make you just a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, next number is the number that you would definitely be happy to get. You'd be proud of yourself. Honestly, it's probably the number that you will end up getting. And this is going to be most likely in the middle of your range. And then the last one is your bottom line. Um, so this is the number that, you know, if it's anything less than this, you have to commit to walking away because you're going to do all of your finances. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and so I know it's compelling if somebody, if a job that you really want and they give you something super low, you might still want to take it. If you've taken your time now to lo really look at your finances and determine what is actually your bottom line, you do have to commit to it. So 
This is why I love salary negotiation because this is so much more than just asking for money. This is you really understanding and developing your relationship with money um, and your relationship with yourself and your worth. Uh, so this is the bottom line, guys, okay? But now how do you figure out your bottom line? A lot of people throw that word around. And again, because when we really want something, it's easy to go beneath it. So the way that I look at my bottom line, this is just math, or at least it begins with math. It's your budget after tax. So there is a rule, the 50-30-20 rule. I did not come up with it, but it works. So you're looking at your budget in terms of, all right, what are the things that you must have right now, right? The roof over your head, the food that you eat, right? Um, there are certain payment, like if your cell phone, right? The things that you need to live, right? 50% of your income after tax goes there, okay? So then we have the nice to haves, and this is 30% of your budget. Things that are fun, right? Things that I've now completely cut out of my life because of COVID. So, but these are things usually like going out maybe uh, to the movies with my friends. Um, it could be buying more nail polish, right? Things that I really like, but I don't actually need as much as I try to convince myself that I do. Uh, and then after that, it's 20% of your debt and your savings, right? So you have to make sure that you're paying off your credit card debt, your student debt. Super, super, super important. Right? And you're thinking towards the future as well. And that's 20%. This is your budget. Now, this is the non-math part. This is the qualitative part. Make a list of all of the things that this company is giving you besides money, right? So what are some perks? What are the things about the job that make you want to take the job? So I don't know, maybe it's an easy commute, right? Maybe this is a, a company that's, you know, 10 minute drive. That's a perk. Um, maybe it's a company who, you know, you've been dying to work there. You love, um, you'll love the people you work with. You, um, it's a fancy title, right? Maybe you're thinking a few steps ahead and, and on your resume, this is going to look really good. Uh, so it's looking at all of these things together. So it's taking your budget. It's looking at the perks that the company can give you besides the money and really asking yourself the tough question of, am I willing to financially sacrifice? If I don't get the money that I want, if I get the bottom line or below the bottom line, is this commute worth it? You know, do I really need this fancy title? Right. So about essentially at the end of the day, it's up to you about what you're willing to sacrifice financially. No one else can make that decision for you. So, so please take your time with this. Um, and it's not just about the money that you want, but it's also about um, your willingness to walk away. So have that completely prepared so that when when and if they do give you a number that's below your bottom line, you can say, I'm not, I'm not going to take this. And you can feel confident about that. Um, check out Indeed's salary database. Um, go to indeed.com backslash salaries. Um, and it will have so many different things that you can look at. Lots of comparisons. Remember, more research is better. Although at some point you do need to just distill this down. Um, but I, they're just such a great resource. So shout out to Indeed. But now let's think beyond the paycheck. You can get way more things than money, and guess what? You should. So what are these things? Uh, well, first of all, it's called full compensation, full comp. Um, these are things like flexibility, um, getting a higher commission maybe. Um, certainly the start date and moving costs, that's negotiable. Stock options, um, travel, right? Maybe they can pay for your gas. Um, career development, that's a huge one. That's one everybody should be asking for. So we're talking about going to conferences, um, taking the ladies get paid webinars, right? Um, so what this is all called is full compensation and it's something that I want you to bring up after you figured out the money part. It's a bit controversial, okay? Because sometimes we might hear, well, negotiate everything at once, bring up the salary and talk about full compensation as one package. My advice is a bit different. My advice is to get through the money conversation and at the end of that say, and now I'd like to discuss full compensation. Now, the reason that I like to separate those two parts of the conversation is that if they know that you want, I don't know, career development, they might use that as leverage to get you down on the dollar amount, right? So, oh, well, we can give you career development. Um, how about that with this lower salary? And you've kind of just shown your cards. So get the money done, then say, let's talk about full compensation. Um, just one thing is the way that you can wrap your head around full comp, because there are so many more op, um, things that I have here. This is just a starting point. The way to think about it is what brings you value that either costs the company no money or just a little bit of money. And you might be thinking, well, if the company can't afford to give me a higher salary, then how would they be able to afford to send me to a conference? 
Absolutely a legitimate question. Most companies have separate budgets for these things. So they'll have a pot of money that's dedicated to salaries, and then they'll have another pot of money that is dedicated to benefits, right? Things like career development. Uh, by the way, when you uh, go in and, and talk about these things, have a list in your mind, but have your priorities ready to go because you're not going to ask for everything. You're not going to get everything. So maybe what are the top three things that you want and what's the most important thing that you want? Okay. When you bring it up, don't just drop it there. I want career development, right? Position it as a benefit to them, right? So you can say, I would like to have career development because I'm working on, you know, X skill. I'd like to take management training and then tie it to how that's going to help them. And honestly, it could be, I just want to be better at my job, right? Things like that. Uh, flexibility. Um, it make, I'm extremely productive when I get to work from home, although now I guess we're all sort of working from home. Um, so when you say something, just already anticipate in your mind, what are the reasons that they may say no, right? And be able to proactively address that. So it's never just, here's what I want and you're done, right? Here's what I want and why. Full compensation, guys. And by the way, if there are any of these that are a deal breaker for you, um, you, know, you, you need flexibility um, because you're a caregiver at home, whatever it is, you should absolutely bring that up before the money conversation. So my advice before about, you know, separate the money talk with the full compensation talk, I still stand by that, but I'm not talking about a, a certain case where there is something, a, a perk that you do absolutely need to have, in which case that should be brought up um, while you talk about the salary. Um, hopefully that made sense. Time to make your case, guys. So this, in my, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I think this is the most important part of our entire conversation. Uh, it's important for salary negotiation and it is important for your performance review. You have to talk about your wins, guys. It's not just about the fairness in the market. It's not just because you deserve it. It's because you've effectively shown them that you've had an impact on their business um, or you've had an impact on the previous business you worked at and that you're invaluable and you are worth every penny that you were asking for. Uh, now, when I ask you, what is uh, a win that you've had or, or tell me about some of your achievements, that can actually be hard for a lot of people. Uh, either they have too many, which is awesome if they do. Um, usually it's, I don't know what they are because it was just my job, right? How do you know the difference between something that's a win and I just was doing my job? Uh, and especially if you're feeling like you need to be more humble, right? Like you're bragging to talk about this. We're just going to put that to the side for a minute here. Let's think about our wins in the following ways. Um, what are some obstacles that came your way, challenges that came your way? And, um, you know, how did you overcome them? Any time that you went above and beyond, uh, any time that you did something that was self-motivated, uh, programs, processes, products that you've created, um, what you're excited about. If you talk about things that light you up, that's going to get people to want to give you the money, right? Uh, and also the reason I say what you're excited about is make sure that you're filtering what you talk about in regards to the work that you actually want to do. What I mean by this is, is this. Let's say you created some kind of um, communication process in your team. You made it more efficient for them to communicate. It was awesome, right? And you absolutely hated it, okay? You hated it. Don't bring it up. Even though it makes you look really good, you're effectively saying, hey, I want to do more of this, right? They're going to reward you for your good work by giving you more of that thing, right? So really filter this through what do you actually want to do moving forward? Talk about ideas for the future. Uh, it's not just about being rewarded for the past, but it's sort of looking at your accomplishments as evidence for what you're capable of doing forward. You know, the, the negotiation you, you do and the raise that you get, that, in my opinion, is basically their confidence it's their vote of confidence in you that you can knock it out of the park. Um, and your ideas for the future, think about a sales pitch, right? You like my idea? You want to buy my idea? A little bit. You're not going to say it like that, but hopefully you understood what I meant. Um, another thing is to find your original job description um, for your last job or if you're negotiating at your current position. Find your original job description and then write an entirely new one based on all the things that you did. I want you to compare them. I am very curious if the scope change between those two descriptions are radically different, right? If you 
basically have changed your job throughout the last year, three years, whatever it is? Have you taken on the work of multiple people, right? I'm sure you'll find that you have really taken on so much more than what the original job description required of you. Uh, and one way to think about this is if you were writing a job description um, to for somebody to be your replacement. And so it's within that scope change where you can focus on what are the two, at least two wins that I want to bring up. And I would have, I would say two wins. Um, you can know more, obviously you should know more, but at least two things that demonstrate a range of your capabilities. Uh, and also, again, if this is just one last thing, um, if you're negotiating for a new job and you're not sure which of your past wins you want to talk about, I would absolutely go through their job description and take key words, key responsibilities that they've listed and find um, examples from your past that can speak to their job description. You can even print it out, guys. You can print out their job description and have your, you know, yours ready to go and be able to say, you know, here were three things that stood out for me in the job description. Um, and I want to show you three things that I did that um, should make you want to hire me. Obviously put it in your own words. Uh, and by the way, speaking of bringing in materials, uh, somebody in my community did an entire PowerPoint presentation. It wasn't for a new job, uh, although that would have been sort of fun, but she did give a very serious presentation with lots of footnotes of all of her uh, sources, and she got the raise. Now here's the framework to talk about it. So you've picked, you've picked your win. You're feeling good about that. We're all too humble usually. We rush through our stories. We don't give ourselves enough credit. So let's slow this down and create our stories based on this method that I call STAR. STAR method. So it's an acronym. A, it stands for situation. T is task. A is action. And R is results. So let's walk through this. Um, if we were all together, I would have you write this down and share, but we're not together. But that doesn't get you off the hook because you can definitely write this down. Um, and so I would just sketch out a couple of things right now. So let's pick up the situation of your, of your accomplishment. Give us context about it. So who, what, when, where, why, all the details about the starting point here. Most importantly, what was at stake? There is always something at stake. There really is, right? And when you talk about what something is at stake, that makes me very interested as the listener. I want to know more, right? Uh, by the way, if it feels weird to write your own story, just imagine that you are writing a screenplay, a movie, and you're the main character, and so write for that main character. Um, and yes, I'm saying write it down. Um, this is a great way to practice it. Overwrite, because you're then gonna call it down, you're gonna rehearse it with a friend. So start just really big, all the details. You've, you've established where we are, which is great. Okay, T, what was the task? So essentially, what were you asked to do? Um, or what did you take on yourself? And what was your role? Really straightforward. A, this is where the meat will go. What did you do? Not just that, how did you do it? Because your process shows a lot of stuff about you. For example, let's say you're talking about a time when you had to put on an event, but you were given no budget, and there was a week turnaround time, and it was in a city where you didn't know anybody. Those are all things that are at stake, right? So I'm not just going to say, well, I created an invitation. I um, got people to show up. I, no, I'm going to show you how did I do it? What's the scrappiness, the resiliency, the resourcefulness, the creativity, all of these things that went into getting this thing done, I want to talk about, right? No details too small. Remember, you're going to end up editing it down, but let's start with all the details. Now, this is the key part. Results. Okay, what happened? You have to figure out what the impact was. And we're going to try to quantify it. So for example, how many people showed up at the event? Um, obviously, how many products did you sell? You posted on social media. How many people clicked on it? Um, you also want to include qualitative results. So did you get um, you know, feedback from the event? Uh, all throughout the year, you should be recording your wins. Put them in a spreadsheet. When somebody emails you and says, good job, you know, even if it's just a coworker, take a screenshot Put it into what I call a brag book, a folder on your desktop. And so when it's time to tell your story, you essentially already have these testimonials, right? So bring those into this. Um, also, I think it's good to talk about what you learned from this experience um, because, I mean, think right now, I don't know if any of you have hired people uh, yourselves, but when we do hire people, or at least when I've hired people, I'm looking for somebody who's a fast learner. I think that's probably every single person who is a hirer. You want somebody who's going to move fast, learn fast, 
And so I want to see from you in your story, your ability to gain knowledge, right? That's going to be a vote of confidence for the future with you. Um, if you're not sure what your impact was, please talk to people who are involved. Um, and, and don't be afraid to go back to your manager and say, hey, I want to get a better understanding of my role in this company, of how this company operates. Like, what is really the impact of the work that we do? And by the way, guys, if you're having a really hard time with this, just remember that your impact at least impacts another team. So if it's not quite clear how your impact brings in, I don't know, money to the company, because that's the best result you can find, right? That you've been able to improve the bottom line. If that's not something that is easy for you to figure out, at least understand how what you do um, impacts your team and what your team does. How does that impact another team? Um, and the last thing I'm going to say about this um, before I get to the next section, again, I just think this is so crucial because if we don't show the impact we've had on our company's bottom lines or, or in our company ecosystem, we're just showing up to work. Um, so to be compelling, you have to really nail the impact. I'm going to tell you a quick story about this. Um, I was teaching a workshop a couple of months ago, and there was a woman there who, um, this was at a publication, a very uh, well-known publication. There was a woman there who was a videographer. Um, she, you know, and she raised her hand. She said, I don't really know what my impact is. I mean, I guess I can show you how many views that people had on my video. And that's kind of it. Not sure how to show you that that brings, you know, the money in. And fortunately, there was a woman in the audience who uh, was on the sales side. And she raised her hand and she said to this woman, I use videos, I have, and specifically, I've used your video in pitch presentations to potential clients, right? Because the magazine makes their money by ad revenue, right? And so there is no product without this person creating videos, and so these two women talk together and though there wasn't this like perfect end result here to the story, at least the videographer could speak to, well, my videos get used in pitch presentations that then bring in clients. And that of course is money, right? So it's understanding sort of your place in the chain of how your company operates. So start asking if you don't know. Superpowers. Okay. I love this graphic. Uh, I didn't make it. Uh, I love it. Okay. So this is stuff that basically makes you, you, uh, they're kind of intangible. They're a little bit more on the kind of emotional intelligence area. It's things about you that others experience. Um, enthusiasm, for example, right? Uh, positivity. Are you detail oriented? You have a lot of empathy. Right? If you're really efficient with your work, do you, um, do you come up with lots of ideas, right? If you're innovative, um, leadership. One other one that's not on here, and by the way, there are actually a ton that aren't here, so please Google around and talk to your friends. Um, something that I didn't include is um, institutional knowledge. So if you've worked at your company for a long time and you're negotiating, um, that is very valuable uh, because if they were to lose you, if you were to quit, for them to replace you, man, they're going to have to train that person so much, right? You're the wealth of knowledge for a lot of people. Um, so having that institutional knowledge is absolutely superpower. Now, the question is, uh, why does this matter, right? Okay. So the reason it matters is because you are being hired for you as a human being, right? Of course, you're being hired for your skills and your ability to function in the role, but they're hiring a human being who fits in with a team who then fits in with the larger company, right? So they also need to have a good understanding of who, what you're gonna bring to the table, right? Your personality, how that's gonna look at the team. And don't assume that they know that, that they can pick up on it, especially, you know, we get nervous when we're interviewing, so maybe they're not gonna be able to see all these things, right? Knowing that you're detail-oriented, it's, it's hard to express that. Uh, so already have in your mind a few superpowers that you wanna explicitly talk about, and tying it to the impact you had. So, right, it would sound a little bit weird to say, I'm a really positive person. Like that's, that's sort of awkward, right? So maybe it's, I know that my positivity has had a huge effect on my team. And here's how, right? Here's, you know, we, there were some layoffs, the morale was kind of low, right? I took everybody out for lunch or I did a thing or my positivity really got people moving again and having higher morale led to higher productivity. This doesn't need to be a science. It's just telling a story. Um, and if you're not sure what your superpower is, I understand that because we're really too close to ourselves. Uh, I would think about what comes naturally to you. What's just really effortless for you. Um, and then think about two people you can ask. 
somebody you've worked with before, definitely. Um, the other person, they don't have to have worked with you. And just ask them, uh, what's my effect on you? What's my impact on you? You know, how do you experience me? Um, and you might be pleasantly surprised. You probably have a huge, huge impact on folks and you didn't even know. It might make you cry. Um, let's talk about preparing what we're actually going to say, which we're doing well on time. I've got about five minutes before we get into the Q&A, but we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, we've got to avoid words that just weaken us. Words like, I feel or I believe, I think, just, only, might, actually. So here's an example. I just have a question. Or I actually have a question. Why do I say that? I have a, do you have a question or not? Why is there a just? Why is there an actually? Um, it just hedges. You're caveating. You're not definitively saying, right? Uh, so keep that in mind. Ums, of course. And the only way you're going to be able to, you know, figure out how to not have these words in your vocabulary is to start noticing, to start observing. Oh, I hate this slide, guys. I apologize in advance that I have to talk about this, but I have to talk about it. So there's a thing called the double bind, right? Okay, what the double bind is, is effectively when a woman acts outside of what we expect her to be, right? The social norms, we then penalize her. Okay, so what that looks like is if a woman is expected to be accommodating and sweet, right? To not disrupt. And she then goes in and acts assertively, right? Salary negotiation. I know my worth, right? And I'm standing up for my worth. Chances are, because of the double bind, we're now going to perceive that woman as aggressive, right? So she's not assertive. Oh, she's aggressive. This is why women tend to be called, you know, bossy. A lot of that is because of the double bind. Now, here's the really crappy part. Women do this to other women just as much as men do it. So for you, just check yourself. Make sure that you are not evaluating other women um, more harshly than men. Um, and, and sometimes just beginning with yourself, I mean, that really is how we start to rectify this. Each one of us, if we do some self-reflection, do I judge women in this way? We got to do something about it. We got to stop. Now, the reason I'm bringing up the double bind during a salary negotiation conversation is because this is a time where you are assertive and that can be perceived negatively. Remember at the way beginning, I did say it's not so much what you say, but how you say it. This is something to think about here. So one way to get around the double bind is to continually express your enthusiasm, your appreciation, um, to say, I respect your budgetary restraints. I understand using those words. Say we, um, and obviously don't take credit away from yourself. You absolutely want to say what you did, right? You want to use the word I, but you also want to show that you're a team player because this is, again, when women tend to get penalized. She's being selfish. Positive body language. You all know what that is, right? You're not like this. I'm going to give you a fun tip. So when humans want to bond with each other, actually, it might not just be humans. I think many animals do this. When humans want to bond with each other, we mimic one another. So you can do this little experiment. If you itch your nose, I guarantee you a few seconds later, the person you're talking with, oh, they're going to itch their nose too. And then you're going to notice that you're doing things like that, right? I was talking to somebody the other day and she was leaning like this. And all of a sudden I find myself leaning and I know how this works. So it was just involuntary. Now you're thinking, why is she talking about that? It's interesting. Why is it relevant? Well, it's relevant because if you're not quite sure how to hold your body in this negotiation or how to sort of what energy you need to be exchanging with them, go off of what they're doing, right? Assume the posture there they're doing. Don't be weird about it, guys. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, so don't be weird, but you can go off of their cues. Uh, so again, apologies for having to talk about the double bind. Um, you can start doing more research on your own. It is a real thing. And this is why there's that quote, you know, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in heels. Right? This is how it works. I hate it. And let's all have a big uh, collective sigh together. Calm your nerves. All right, you are ready to walk in there. You have done your research, you're feeling good, you have a compelling story to tell, right? But you are so nervous that you just don't negotiate at all. Or you're so nervous you negotiate yourself down, which I have actually done. Obviously breathing, breathing is good. I want you to also think about one word that you would like to appear as. So serene, confident, right? When you think about that one word and you really focus on it and you visualize in your head, what does that look like? What does serenity look like? 
I'm going to assume you might actually adopt that when you're in there. When you're thinking about a bunch of stuff, you're not going to focus. So one thing, serenity, okay? Um, putting yourself in their shoes, again, uh, negotiation. I mean, they're going to have to go back to their boss and tell them that, that they lost you, right? You walked away. So they absolutely want to make this work. Remember, if you are at a place where you're negotiating, um, they're, everybody's invested. And if you're trying to reach a compromise, you can think about it in this way. A compromise is essentially when two people, when two parties both have to give up something in order for both of them to get something. So the negotiation is you just figuring it out. What are both of you willing to give up and what are both of you willing to get? Um, pretending you're in a movie. I talked about that before in terms of writing your own story. But seriously, uh, in the days leading up to it or, or maybe just the day of, from the minute you wake up to the minute you walk into that room, watch yourself. You're going to cheer for yourself because we all cheer for the main character usually. And what you realize when you're watching a movie is that it's just one scene. The negotiation, whatever happens in that room leads to the next scene. Let's say when you're watching the movie, the negotiation goes terribly. Let's say it's really uncomfortable, right? But because of that, maybe the main character realizes, hey, I don't want to work there anyway. Or maybe they're down, right? But then a couple days later, they meet somebody who changes their life. Point being, this is just another experience in your life. It's not a test. It's not the end of the road, right? And so watching yourself like a movie, I think what it does is it gives you perspective. Uh, accepting your fear. You definitely, definitely need to practice negotiating, and we're going to get to the scripts in just a bit. Um, so while you're practicing, yes, you're practicing your lines, right? You're trying to memorize, but I also want you to really tap into your body and see sort of when and where you begin to have agitation, right? So at what point does your, I don't know, heart start to race a little bit faster, right? At what point do your palms get sweaty, right? At what point do you stumble over your words, okay? I want you to just accept that it may happen. It'll probably happen. What I don't want you to do is to think to yourself, well, I practiced this so many times, it's not going to happen. That's just putting up more pressure on you guys. It really is. Because now you pride so hard, you're going to, you know, you can't mess up. You can't mess up. And if you do, you're going to be mad at yourself. No, you practiced, you understood that this is what might happen. And when you go in there, if it does happen, it's not going to startle you. Right? You've seen this one before. And I think it's the, the surprise element that then freaks us out when you have made sense of this before, when it is a familiar feeling, even though you don't like it, when it's familiar, it can go, all right, well, that's when that happens. Whew, I think it's going to start to just go away on its own. Protecting your energy, um, because negotiating is really, um, it can be vulnerable. You're putting yourself out there. You're asking um, for what you believe your value is. Make sure that whatever the answer is, if that answer is no, that it does not affect your sense of self, your self-esteem, your identity, right? This is also just business. So if you can try to separate and protect yourself from the actual negotiation, please, please do that. And one way to do it uh, for me has been this visualization. Um, I do this uh, almost every day now is just imagining that I have some kind of paint over me, this like golden paint, and I've covered my whole body. And it's a shield, right? But the reason for me it's like a gold paint and not this kind of like soldier Teflon shield is because I want to be able to connect with you. I want to have feelings, right? I want to have that empathy. But there needs to be some demarcation between myself, how I present, and then how I am received. The last thing here is uh, doing it for somebody else. Uh, sometimes it's easier to advocate on behalf of somebody else than it is even on ourselves. So, you know, your child, your mother, your cat over there, you know, uh, they're cheering you on. And remember that. Let's talk about those scripts, guys. Uh, and I know we're going to, I'm running just a little bit late here uh, to get to Q&A, but I'll keep going. And then LaFon, you can let me know. Uh, I'm happy to hang around after. How much do you make? That's the question that we tend to get when we're negotiating at our new job. How much do you make? Guess what, guys? In a lot of cities and states, that's actually an illegal question. It's called the salary history ban. Um, definitely encourage you to look it up. Uh, I don't think it's national yet, um, so it depends on where you live. I know where I am in New York City, um, they are not allowed to ask. So employers are forbidden from asking potential candidates, potential uh, employees, how much they currently make. Now, the reason that this became a law is because if marginalized groups, right, if women or people of color, if we are already making less money when we graduate school, 
if every job is based on what we were making before, then over time that compounds. And that's why we're seeing such huge wage gap, like the fact that women tend to lose between half a million and $1 million over the course of a lifetime due to things like this, right? Now, if they still ask you, you have a couple of options. I like the telling the truth, actually. I tell them what I make and then I pivot to what I want to make because what you made before probably is not very relevant to what you're asking for now. Think about who you were when you were originally hired, right, at that job and the offer that you received. Think about the growth that you've had, the experiences that you've had, the skills that you've gained, right? Maybe this new job, it's a totally different company and therefore the market research is a completely different answer, right? So pivot quickly to that. You can also be a bit abstract about it, right? Oh, I'm making the low five figures. Um, you could say that your boss prefers you keep it confidential. You could talk about the salary history ban. Um, women, uh, this is, goes back to the double bind. If women evade the question, um, we are looked at a little bit with, hmm, it's a bit sketchy that they did that, whereas men don't get any, there's no opinion about that. So I actually think it would be in our, you know, as women's best interest to just tell the truth. Um, and by the way, do you think about this here? If you always base your salary on what you were paid before, that's going to now hurt you in the long run, which is me saying, do not base your salary on what you were paid before. Again, it has nothing to do with all the skills you've experienced, you know, that you've accumulated until now. You're basing it on the market research. Uh, okay, so how much do you want to make? This is the question. I would tell them the research that you did. Say, typical rate for a person with my experience tends to make between X and Y. Because I'm a top performer, I would, of course, be looking um, for top dollar. Now, you can always say, I don't want to tell you. Um, and say, it's because I don't want to lose the opportunity, so I'm afraid to go too high. Uh, then put it back on them and say, you know, if you can share your budget or share more information about the role, uh, let's figure out something that works for both of us. So um, you notice right here, I said us, right? Together, we can work together, okay? Um, another option, um, just I would prefer to learn more about the position and how I could contribute to your team before discussing salary. Then they say, that's too high for us. We were thinking something closer to X. You can say, that's a great starting point. And then you go into your uh, feeling good number. So let me just back up for a minute. Um, my recommendation when you are negotiating is for you to start, right? You're anchoring high. If you go off of what they say, chances are what they say is quite low. Ooh, it's going to knock you off your game. You're going to feel bad. Now you have to try to get them from low to high. So instead, if you were the first one to say your number and you're saying it in a way that is evidence-based, you're already telling the story about how you're a top performer, how you came to that number, then it's on them. But let's assume they say bottom line, right? Real low. What are you going to counter with? Feeling good. Feeling good number. But then you have to be quiet. You have to be quiet. Ah, oh, it's hard. It's hard. I know. Does anyone have uh, issues with being quiet? I do, right? It's uncomfortable. Uh, when you are quiet, it shows your power, right? It shows your power. They give you an offer. Buy time, guys. The way that you start your job is the way that your negotiation ended. So if you end it with appreciation, right, gratitude, but you're not going, thank you so much, huh? you know, we, we have to still, um, you're in demand here, right? And so say, I, you know, this is a major life decision and I would love to discuss it with my family. So um, I request some more time to consider, is that a possibility? Even if your family's your cat, guys, you can still say this. Um, and then always get your offers in writing. It, it just doesn't exist unless it's written down. Um, I've heard way too many uh, horror stories of people who were given a verbal offer that never came through. You have another offer. Um, tell them. Tell them that you have another offer, but that you really want to stick with this company, but the other offer was a lot more money. How can you get me closer to this number? Give them a chance. Um, all, you can ask, what would you do in my position? Right? And then you don't be afraid to walk away. I mean, before you walk away, if they really can't budge, this is absolutely when you should bring up full compensation. Okay. You should be have already negotiated it, but if they really can't get the number you want, then you should be asking for more full comp than you originally thought you would. Um, and negotiating at a current job. All right, so when to ask. Um, find out when the budget cycle is and schedule a meeting with your manager. 
um, to talk about if you're doing the work that gets reported. So if you're waiting until you know it's review time to have that conversation, it's too late because chances are the budget was already decided, right? So maybe it's six months before your review, have a check-in with your manager and tell them about the career growth that you want to have, right? Um, talk to them about next steps. Um, you don't have to explicitly talk about the raise, but you are essentially indicating that that's where you're going by expressing to them, I want to level up here. Am I doing the kind of work that gets me there? Go to them when you had a win. If there's something you did, knocked it out of the park, got some great feedback, definitely go in and have a conversation. Am I doing the work that gets rewarded here? Always say opportunities for growth. That's a great language. I want to make sure I'm doing a great job. So again, I know this is about you getting intel for the raise um, and positioning yourself well for it, but it also is demonstrating to them that you, um, you want to stick around, that you love that this company enough to even have this conversation. Uh, if they won't budge, this goes back to what I said before. It's just getting creative about where else the money could come from. Um, it's, is there equity? Um, timeline also, right? Um, if the next time they're going to talk to you about this is in a year, can you say, let's revisit in six months? And if they say yes, then have a, put it on the calendar, first of all, because again, it doesn't exist when you don't have it in writing. So send them immediately a calendar invite and then send them another calendar invite for three months before so you can make sure that you are doing the work that they need to see. So getting as much information from them is fantastic because you can then use that as part of your pitch. Of course, ask for full compensation, always. Uh, so I am exactly at time. So that's, I guess, good for me that I did this in an hour, but I know that we have a couple of questions that LaFon uh, sourced from the Indeed community. Um, so I don't know if she wants to jump in right now. Happy to stick around for the next couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, LaFon, do you want to kind of take it away from here? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing such great advice for everyone. Uh, we are well over time, but I do want to get to maybe one to two questions that were, were asked on the Indeed community already, if that's okay with you. Uh, sure. So we'll start with the first one, which is what advice can you share about salary negotiation during these times? Should we be grateful for whatever amount is offered and not negotiate at all due to COVID-19? Yeah, this is really tough. Uh, I was talking to, to LaFon earlier about this in that when we advocate for people to do market research, the market's in flux, right? The market doesn't know what the market's doing right now, um, which means that this is a great time to be talking to people about it um, because I think there's more of a willingness now to have these conversations since we're all, every single one of us, in a money boat together. Uh, so this is a good time to start the conversation. Everyone should always negotiate. My feeling is, you know, why would you reject yourself? Let them reject you. Let them tell you no. But what you want to do is negotiate with empathy. You want to, of course, acknowledge what's going on Right. Um, and so ask with empathy um, and a willingness to say, uh, let's figure this out together. So continually using the words together, together, you know, saying, I know this is a conversation. Right. So it's not it's less of a negotiation, but it's, you know, a dialogue between two people who are both committed to making it work. And so if you're positioning it that way, uh, it will it'll well be received. Um, but don't not negotiate. I would never give that advice. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, this next one is kind of near and dear to my heart. I, earlier, you shared that, you know, talk to a couple friends, talk to some family, talk to people that you can bounce uh, ideas on. It actually helps you with your confidence. And I have a, a cousin who's a fantastic negotiator. I take her with me when I want to get a new car, when I'm getting a loan or anything like that. She's amazing. And that really helped with confidence. And so this next question is when you, when you haven't really negotiated before, um, or you don't really have that confidence yet, how should I navigate screening calls that ask for my salary range? Mm -hmm. I feel like I usually show my cards too early and maybe sell myself short on what they could offer. Sure. This is a really great question, especially if you are filling out job applications that ask you uh, how much you want to get paid. Also, um, recruiters will do this too. Uh, and I'm talking about um, headhunters, people who work for staffing agencies, um, and they're trying to sell you into the company. So they're asking you how much you want to make. And that's like the first question they ask you. Um, research, it's always research. And if you can give a range, give that range. Say the research I did is between X and Y, right? Because again, this is the starting conversation. Um, this might be controversial. 
I would go with something in the middle or towards, yeah, something in the middle. If this is what's stopping you from getting in the door, because a lot of companies will screen their applications, putting it through a system where they're looking for certain keywords. Um, so this is assuming this company isn't, there isn't like a human person, you know, going through one by one. If they're screening applications and your number might somehow get you out, um, I want you to just at least get in the door. So I would say somewhere in the middle of the range is the place to start. And then when you get that interview, and you're having the conversation, you can talk more broadly about the research that you did um, and also express that you've learned more about the role now. And so you think it's uh, you know commensurate with a higher salary. You'll also be able to talk about all of your wins, right? So just go at least, I would say, for the middle number um, because you'll have wiggle room either way when you finally do get that interview. Wonderful. Okay, we will go one more. Uh, this was also kind of a top question on the Indeed community. And this one is, how do you manage your salary expectations when you're shifting your career? I could imagine that that's really happening a lot during the, the era of COVID-19, where people are going to going into different industries, different types of jobs. Um, so uh, this person is asking, can I make a career change without having to take a huge pay cut? Uh, career pivots. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, of course, it depends on, on, you know, if you're going from like arts nonprofit to coding at a major tech company, well, you're probably going to get paid more. So that's the good, that's the good pivot. Uh, you're probably going to have to take a pay cut, right? Because again, in contextualizing the number that you ask for, remember, we, we said it has to be years of experience. It has to be a skill set, right? All those things contribute to the number that they ultimately give you. So be ready to take a pay cut. But this is when you have to really make an even more compelling case about how what you did before, the skills, the life experiences, your superpowers, how is that transferable to this new job? I think as an outsider, you bring a really unique perspective, right? You may be able to see things that the people who'd been there before haven't been able to see. You're going to be walking in with a different kind of network, right? You're going to have people in your Rolodex that maybe could become clients or things like that, right? Um, so, so your value isn't just the skills that are required on the job description, right? But again, you have to show them that your value comes in unexpected ways. And so that's what you're going to use to make that compelling case on why you're asking for more. So point being, it's still all the same advice. You're still negotiating in the market research, in the framework that I told you, right, in the order in which I told you, um, but just know that you'll probably have to put a lot more emphasis on the things that you've done and really tie, you know, how it's transferred. My recommendation is when you are trying to figure out the most compelling story you can tell, please go find friends uh, or people in your life that do sales or who do marketing or PR, right? It is their job to sort of spin, right? And so get feedback from them about how you can kind of best weave a tale that shows you uh, in a really uh, attractive light um, for whatever job that you're applying to. Fantastic, Claire. It's kind of connected to another question that we have because that is, you know, career pivot, you have experience, but you're just going into maybe another space or another type of role. But there was a question about, you know, how do you justify salary negotiation when you don't have the experience? Should you negotiate entry level pay? Um, yes, 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 yes. You should always, always negotiate. I encourage you to take classes if you can. Um, just even if it's, you know, online course, night class, just like some kind of certification um, that speaks to exactly what you will be doing at that job or even the next level um, so that yes, they're getting you entry, but you've already, you know, are familiar with who it is that you're going to be working for and what they do. Right. Um, so see if you can get some kind of certification and speak to that. Um, and also again, remember that the first number that the employer is giving out, they know that that is only the first number. There's an expectation that you will counter it. So even if you're entry level, even if you don't have much experience, you can say, I was looking for something or, you know, X is a great starting point. I was looking at something more like the middle of the pay band and then reiterate something that you did uh, that shows your character because that might be sort of the best case that you can make, especially if you're a recent college grad, you don't have the traditional job experience. Hopefully you have that certification, uh, but it can, you know, you can definitely tell a story about how creative you are um, or how you hustled. You worked three jobs, right? You are a hard worker. That is something the company will want you to do. Um, so get creative, find anything and everything you can talk about and, do it with enthusiasm. Um, again, the worst thing that can happen is they say no. 
Um, so just make sure you're not saying no to yourself first. There it is. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing all of this great advice on negotiation. That's it for today. Uh, for the latest information from Indeed, please follow us on social media as we'll continue to share relevant updates there. Thank you for tuning in and have a fantastic day. And join Ladies Get Paid. That is my last, my last pitch. That too. <laughs> uh, you have to check us out, ladiesgetpaid.com. You'll get our newsletter. We do a bunch of webinars, workshops. We've got that private online network for you to talk to other women about their salaries. Um, we also have ladiesgetpaid.com slash the Institute. We just launched it. Uh, called the Institute for Higher Earning. And uh, it's 30 hours of content, um, everything you need to know about your uh, career path and your financial future. Uh, and so in the email, follow-up email that we're going to be sending, we're going to give you a 30-day free trial. So definitely take it, get in touch with me, at Ladies Get Paid, uh, give us a shout out, and um, maybe we'll repost you. Anyway, really appreciate this so very much, guys. Thanks for having me indeed. Um, and hopefully we can do this again soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Claire. Bye, everybody. Thank you.